Good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us for this year's Extended Education Homecoming and our webinar entitled, Let's Talk Lifelong Learning, where we'll hear from our own experts about current trends in continuing education and what they could mean for you and your career. My name is David Manzik and I'm the Acting Dean of the Division of Extended Education here at the University of Manitoba. And I'm pleased to act as the moderator for today's session, which will last about an hour. If you're an Extended Ed alumni or alumna, welcome back and thanks for joining us today. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the University of Manitoba campuses are located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota and Denny peoples and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past. And we dedicate ourselves to moving forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. As we are all aware, the past 18 to 20 months have been tremendously challenging for all of us. And we've seen the nature of work change before our eyes as many of us have learned to work from home, combining both our work and our family lives in ways we've never had to do in the past. On a broader scale, we've also seen massive changes to the Canadian workforce with some segments like the hospitality and transportation industries significantly affected by the pandemic. However, along with the job losses has been a resurgence in interest in upskilling, reskilling and lifelong learning. And with the advancement of an array of new technologies, these hallmarks of continuing education have become more accessible than ever. So let's meet a few of our resident extended ed experts and ask them what they're currently observing and what they predict down the road. Our panelists this morning are Dr. Rod Laster and Dr. Paul Jenkins, and I'll introduce them briefly now. Rod Laster holds a BSc and an MSc and a PhD from the University of Manitoba and has recently completed an academic leadership program at Dalhousie University in Halifax. He's been the Associate Dean Academic and Extended Ed at the University of Manitoba since 2017. As Associate Dean, he oversees the academic functions related to continuing education course and program delivery in the unit. And since 2020, he's also been the Associate Area Director of the U of M Access Program. Rod played a leading role in the development of the University of Manitoba's new certificate and diploma framework and has led efforts to update non-degree academic admission and progression policies within extended ed. Paul Jenkins has devoted his professional life to education and lifelong learning. He holds a BA from the University of Guelph, an MA from the University of Saskatchewan, and a PhD from the University of Glasgow. He's held teaching, research, consulting, and administrative positions with a variety of organizations, including the BBC and universities in Canada, the US, and the UK. He currently oversees the delivery of online and partnership programming within our unit. So before we begin, let me just say that we plan to go till about 11.45 this morning, leave about 10, 15 minutes for a Q&A at the end of today's session. As the moderator, I'll pose a number of questions to our two panelists, and our hope is that we can have a free willing conversation about current trends in continuing education and lifelong learning. To those of you tuning in, please feel free to pose questions of your own in the chat, and we'll try to get to as many of those questions at the end. So with that said, I think we're ready to begin. So as you know, the title of this webinar is called Let's Talk Lifelong Learning. And I don't know about you, but I hear that term in a variety of different ways in a, a range of different contexts. So why don't we just start right there? What do we mean by lifelong learning anyway? And I'll turn to you first, Rod. Thanks, David. That's a very good question. And I think lifelong learning is, is something that has been um, mentioned quite a bit as of late. I think it's important to emphasize that the term is actually not new. The term has been around for centuries. And um, in, in its, I guess, in its like original definition, <clears throat> it really refers to the continual efforts of enhancing oneself through the acquisition of new, long, of new knowledge. And in fact, uh, the, the concept is, is so old that, you know, uh, writers and philosophers such as George Bernard Shaw wrote extensively about the virtues of lifelong learning. And in fact, uh, UNESCO considers lifelong learning to be uh, a primary function of human rights. The idea uh, was focused more on education uh, and, and policymaking in the mid 1800s with the recognition that new skills were required in the post-industrial era. 
um, and probably have to wait for another hundred years or so before uh, uh, you know the idea fully blossomed to what we know today. So the question is, what do we know today? Lifelong learning is really considered to be one of the unifying concepts underlying adult, adult education and is considered to be the central tenant of continuing education. And as such, it tends to acknowledge that formal learning does not end once you complete a college or university credential. In fact, gone are the days of higher education attainment leading to a single career outcome. There is a need for continuous you know, education uh, which will be a compelling requirement for lifelong learning, uh, workforce engagement, and personal career satisfaction. Uh, in a recent book written by Michelle Weiss called Long Life Learning, she uh, mentions that there's a multitude of factors that will result in unprecedented turnover in jobs in the coming years. The need to re-enter the workforce following short cycle learning will be a constant, will be a constant. And this idea will be critical as we head towards the middle of the fourth industrial revolution in the post-pandemic world. In other words, uh, when we look at the transformative impacts on work and higher education, lifelong learning would be essential. As a last point I was gonna mention here, uh, last couple of days, I took it upon myself to really ask, well, if lifelong learning is so important, what do we know about our lifelong learners? And I examined 10 years of data of programs that we've been offering in extended education and realized that Amazingly, 35 to 40% of alumni, not extended education alumni, but U of M alumni have been engaged in programs that we offer. Meaning that this idea, although seems uh, nuanced and nascent to many of us, many of our learners have already adopted this concept. And in fact, again, like I said, 35 to 40% of U of M alumni without being asked have actually uh, you know, taken it upon themselves to take at least one or two short programs in order to further their career aspirations. That's interesting. I'm sure that's a, a piece of data that that most people wouldn't be aware of. So thanks for sharing that. Uh, uh, Paul, what what are your thoughts uh, when it comes to lifelong learning? Do you share the same view as, as Rod? Uh, yeah, generally. <clears throat> but in thinking about this, um, I've been I've concentrated mainly on the relationship between adult education, continuing education, and lifelong learning, and in trying to think about that relationship, because of course there is a close one, as Rod has already indicated, but for me, the equation of lifelong learning, um, and this happens quite a lot, seeing lifelong learning as a kind of byword for adult education or adult training, I think can be uh, somewhat limiting. Um, and you see this a lot of places. You see it in academia, you see it in governments and, and policymakers and funding agencies and companies and businesses all over. And I, to me, it's a little bit restrictive. Um, and to sort of get at what I'm talking about here, I'd like to concentrate on the two of the words we typically use in this context here. I'm gonna get a little word nerdy, a little philosophical, but I'll come, I promise to bring it back. Um, if we look at the two words, education and learning, to me, they are very different things. Um, and uh, learning to me is, it refers to something that is considerably broader, more transformative uh, than education. Um, and when we're talking about lifelong learning, and, and Rod's already kind of uh, alluded to this, we're talking about human learning. Um, we're talking about being and becoming and, um, you know, the, the process and practice of learning throughout the entirety of your life. Um, and I think that's, that's, a, that's a really important thing. We're, we're talking about a mindset then, I guess, uh, a, a way of, of, of looking at things. And lifelong learning, therefore, encapsulates all kinds of different levels of learning from the acquisition of certain skills and capacities to, you know, human fulfillment and betterment to society to, to, the, to the needs of the workplace. Um, and uh, to me, that's what lifelong learning really uh, is, is so valuable. It pulls all of those streams together into a single coherent bundle. Um, and uh, it's the silver bullet as far as I'm concerned. You know, it has a really long history, uh, but uh, it, is, it is part of the human experience. Um, and it is tied to everything, you know, to individual fulfillment, professional advancement, to, um, you know, social improvement. I get a sense that we're talking about more than just sort of uh, a human capital perspective on, um, on learning throughout one life. It's not just knowledge and skills 
are we talking about uh, a, a much broader um, a much broader perspective? I think yeah, I think we are, and I think that you know many have already um, mentioned the fact that you know the purpose of universities perhaps is less so with with providing education and more so with enabling uh, you know personal development. In other words, that the education enables uh, learners to have agency on what they do. And so I right. think that the concept of lifelong learning is actually, as Paul just mentioned, is actually more than just, you know, those seeking, you know, continual, you know, like education. It's really those taking agency on their future. And it's really enabling that agency to happen. Now, there are challenges. The biggest challenge out there is, despite the fact that this is a centuries old concept, this, you know, despite the fact that it's been written in charters and it's been written in books and quite extensively for decades and perhaps centuries. In higher education, particularly within universities, is still a little nascent. We still are, we are not really embracing the concept as a strategy. And, and as I mentioned earlier, the 35 to 40 percent of learners who come from the University of Manitoba who are taking programs in a lifelong learning capacity, they're doing it, to be quite honest, not because of any of our efforts or anyone else's efforts are doing it on their own um, dime and they're, you know, on their own interests. And so I think that there needs to be a much, a much better recognition of that. And uh, much later, I can mention something about the human capital, but that's something that also needs to change because I think right. that aspect of capital uh, is, is, is certainly changing. Right. So given how you both responded to that initial question about, you know, what, what lifelong learning is in the, in the first place, let's talk specifically now about the roles of continuing education units like extended education at the U of M. What role uh, should a continuing education units play if, um, in terms of lifelong learning, particularly if it's, it's, it's to be a, we, we want to think of it as a mindset to learning uh, throughout one's life. Thoughts? Paul, we'll start with you. Uh, again, I come back to this, this idea that lifelong learning is about human learning. Um, and it's a bit circuitous perhaps, but I, I'm reminded of, you know, one of the great lessons in, you know, contemporary science has taught us. And that is that all humanity, like the rest of life on this planet is sort of biologically unfinished. Um, yeah. And so from a certain perspective, you know, we're never really an adult, I guess. We never really fully become an adult. Certainly that's not a finished idea. Um, and from a, yeah, so what, what, what we're talking about here is, is a process where learning is an unending process of, of, of completion and learning and learning and learning. Um, and, and this is an important this underscores, I think, the importance of lifelong learning as a concept, but in particular, the role, the unique role, I think, continuing education units can play when it comes to advancing the idea of lifelong learning. This is, this is not an, a done thing. We are never done. Rod's already alluded to the fact that, you know, U of M alumni have, uh, you know, continue to come back uh, and continue to learn. Um, and this is precisely why continuing education units uh, were sort of created in, in the first place. What we're seeing here is, is uh, you know, sort of new conversations, I think, surrounding lifelong learning uh, and what it involves. I think um, this idea that universities are going to embrace some is still kind of a nascent idea, as Rod is saying, we're, but we're beginning to have these conversations. They're beginning to change a little bit more. Um, and we're seeing uh, a surge in continuing education and lifelong learning communities, self-awareness, uh, and this is born out of, I think, um, you know, major transformations in society, politics, and economics. There are lots of transformations coming on. Um, you know, the motivation of individuals to continue their education is driven by these things. Now, in educational institutions are beginning to have different sorts of conversations about how they might collaborate uh, within themselves uh, across, you know, the educational ecosystem. And I think, um, you know, as I was saying, I mean, Continuing education units have been created precisely to work created precisely to address these kinds of major transformations almost 100 years ago. So we have a, a wealth of experience and expertise in, in these areas here. Um, and uh, you know the, the core 
the core questions in the 21st century are maybe a little different um, in terms of lifelong learning and the needs, the lifelong learning needs are a little bit different, but the core functions of continuing education, that blending of uh, theoretical knowledge, sound theoretical knowledge with applied learning is one of the specialties of continuing education units. So I think we are, you know, uniquely well positioned to, to advance this conversation and, and to, to bring it into sort of a, a fuller awareness of, of the full implications of what lifelong learning is as, as, a, as a practice and a way of life, as a mindset. Right. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Rod, do you have anything else to add on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think part of the challenge that we have as a continuing education unit is that I think we need to modernize our our definitions. And I think that you know many of us are still kind of thinking of of higher education um, in the terms of when when the higher education boom occurred, and that was in the nineteen sixties, nineteen seventies, nineteen eighties, right? And I think we're still kind of stuck in that mindset. The reality is, is that we need to be able to understand what the trends are, and the trends are really trends that are economic trends, right? Uh, and, and to really map out the skills uh, that are required to really comprehend what we need to offer. We, need, we also need to have a full understanding of the spectrum of learners out there, the spectrum. There's a wide spectrum. There are people who, who require foundational education and training, others who require post back equivalent to upskilling and reskilling, right? And so, and so I think that we need to have that broad awareness uh, in order to be able to respond. And the last point, which I think is really important when we talk about the modernization of an educational envelope within, within continuing education, and perhaps even within the university as a whole, we need to ask the, you know, ourselves the following question. How do learners learn today compared to 20 years ago or 30 years ago or 40 years ago? When all of us were in our stages of undergrad school, I think it, you know, it was quite different. I think the environment has changed, access to open resources, access to high quality information on the web, um, access to MOOCs. In other words, the perspective of our learners is that learning is becoming a much more self-directed enterprise. It's no longer we control, it's no longer we lecture. It's no longer we stand up in front of a classroom in a very industrialized setting and say, this is what it is. Learners are coming to us with a much more sophisticated perspective. And I think we need to respect that. And we need to acknowledge that in the programs that we develop. Yeah. So uh, we, have, we have to keep our audience in mind and how our audience is changing over time. It's, this is actually, your response is a good segue to my next question, which is, you know, we're hearing a lot about the skills gap in the literature in on lifelong learning, continuing education. We're hearing a lot about the skills gap. We're hearing, hearing a lot about what's called future-proofing young people who are entering the workforce. What is this all about? Are we talking about simply training workers to meet industry needs? And I guess my, my related question would be, if this is the case, is, is this what universities should be doing? Preparing the next generation of uh, workers for industry? So a little bit of uh, maybe your response on this whole notion of the skills gap and, and future proofing. Maybe we'll start with you, Rod. Thanks, David. That's a, that's a big question to answer. Um, I think before I answer that, I think it's important to provide context. Before we talk about future proofing and skills gap, I think the context here is really important. Uh, a lot's been written about the skills gap. In fact, uh, David Willits, who was an author uh, and uh, a former minister in the UK of education, uh, you know, recently stated that, you know, digital revolution will lead to the disintermediation of occupations. Now, what that really stems from is data that has been acquired uh, globally. By 2022, here's what we know. 2022, 42% of core skills required to perform jobs will undergo significant change. In fact, the World Economic Forum estimates that by 2022, there'll be a creation of 133 million new jobs, both entry-level jobs and jobs that require advanced degrees. By 2025, 46%, 46% of occupations will be impacted by digital transformation. And of those, around 30% will no longer exist. And of the ones that are going to be replaced, nearly all of them will require new skills that may not exist or be articulated today. By 2030, by the end of this decade, one in five people globally 
uh, who are in the workforce, of course, will require upskilling and reskilling, right? Nearly 1 billion jobs will be transformed. And the top occupations will be, uh, you know, uh, green technologies, health, health, you know, undergoing enormous changes, information security and statistics, to name but a few. So the bottom line is this, education requirements are increasing and the forms of education are expanding. So to get to your question, David, skills gap. So with that context in play, what is the skills gap? And the skills gap is really the disconnection between the qualifications employers are seeking and those that currently exist and trying to bridge that gap. Now, disruptions like the pandemic have really catalyzed the dynamic nature of global labor markets, uh, which were already in a precarious state prior to 2020. There is debate. Debate is this, is really, is it a lack of in-demand skills or is it a lack of adequate jobs or a combination of the two? Regardless of where we are on that spectrum of that debate, here's the fact. The skills gap has widened. And what's driving the wedge? Digital and and, and tech skills transformation, right? Specifically advances in technology, you know, like artificial intelligence, automation and e-commerce is really changing the impact of, of work uh, and the nature of work as we know it from advanced manufacturing to healthcare. Now to get to the second point of your question, David, future proofing, what does that mean? Well, it's taking that idea and saying, well, how do learners then adapt to the demand and change? And how they adapt is basically by acquiring new skills and competencies that give them greater resilience in the face of disruption, right? In other words, incorporating the very principles of lifelong learning. Two questions. Question number one is, what is the roles of universities? What space do we play in this? And question number two, for policymakers, here's the challenge. For policymakers, the challenge is, is that in order to get a grasp on the precarious nature of the skills gap that is perhaps creating a dystopian view of the future, we need to regulate qualifications of highly unregulated sectors. And the tech sector is a highly unregulated sector. And so I think those are the two questions. How are we going to respond to this, right? And there needs to be much tighter control on this. Last point, you may ask yourself, well, you know, what is our role? Why do we need to respond to this? And I would argue we need to respond for the following reasons. The connection between industrialization, and we're talking about the fourth industrial revolution now, the connection between industrialization and the rise of universal education is very clear. The first industrial revolution gave birth to what I call the universal primary school education uh, concept. Prior to that, it was only for the elite and the few. The second industrial, you know, a revolution led to an increase in STEM education, which uh, you know, resulted in the rise of technocrats. The third industrial you know, revolution, which was the introduction of the personal computer, increased the boom of higher education. So the question is this, that skills gap does have a connection to education and higher education because it is driving change. And that change is historical. Mm -hmm. Good to keep in mind the, the historical context here. So your uh, perspectives uh, over the years has, has, has really helps us uh, understand some of these phenomena that we're, we're uh, dealing with right now in more of, from a, more of a longitudinal perspective. Paul, what, what else would you add on, on that whole notion of the skills gap and future proofing and, and whether or not universities should be in this, in this game, as they say? Well, I, I generally uh, agree with everything Rod's just said there. Um, you know, I think it's important that when we're talking about skills gap, that we work the problem, um, you know, really look, look at what it is, where, where exactly is the gap? Let's not, let's not, you know, get hysterical and say there's a gap everywhere and nothing happens. Because I think in some instances, and I don't want to overstate this, because I absolutely agree with Rod, there is a skills gap, and it's widening and, and the explosion of technological developments in the, is, is really driving that. However, I also think there are cases where the skills gap might be more apparent than real. Um, and what I mean by this is maybe the skills that are missing are the skills of recognizing what your skills are, and then translating what those skills are to the outside world. Um, and so, you know, I, I would say that, and, and that's important. Um, when it comes to future proofing and the skills gap and the relationship here, um, 
uh, I, I, you know, what I've been seeing and, and experiencing a lot uh, in, in conversations and, and dealing with students and partners and, and, and the like is um, the need for a certain kind of agility here. Um, that there's a there's a move away from emphasis on on just a body of knowledge um, and and an emphasis now an increasing emphasis on the ability to do something with that knowledge. What we're looking at here, what we're uh, what I'm seeing uh, quite a bit more of, is um, an emphasis on a blend of soft cognitive and technical skills. And this, and I'd like to come back to this hopefully in, in subsequent conversations. This I think is one of the great challenges before not just universities, but you know, the wider educational ecosystem. How do we come up with courses and programs and curriculum that actually blend uh, these, these kinds of, of learning where traditionally they have been uh, sort of siloed out into different kinds of disciplines and faculties and so on. Um, so, I mean, I, I, would, I would say, I would leave it there, I guess, for now, but uh, I, I do think that the, um, that, that blend uh, of skills is, is quite an interesting one, I think, and an interesting challenge. Good, thanks for that. Now, of course, we've been talking about roles of continuing education units within universities, focusing mm -hmm. on U of M in particular, but, you know, we also know that there are a number of other players when it comes to upskilling, reskilling, and lifelong learning more generally. I'm wondering, um, if we're starting to see a blurring of the lines between what college and colleges and universities do. For example, colleges are now awarding degrees and universities seem to be more involved in skills-based learning and aligning themselves more with industry expectations. So, you know, first of all, is there a blurring of the lines, I guess would be my first question, between what colleges and universities do, as perhaps they, it was in the past, is there a blurring of the lines? And, and if so, should we be concerned at all about this trend? We'll start with you, Paul. That's a tough one. Um, and I have a feeling what I'll say would be unpopular to many. <laughs> um, uh, I, I'm not sure blurring. Uh, to me, blurring, the, the, that suggests that there is in fact some pristine border that should be protected. Uh, right. And I'm, I'm not entirely sure that's true, or maybe I'm not entirely convinced that that border has ever really existed the way it's often purported. Um, you know, modern universities are, uh, and have always been, I think, basically, in and of the societies of that in which they reside. Um, they're embedded in them. They have always been that way. So it's, the fact that, so that they have, so they've always, I think, um, reflected the priorities, the values uh, of those societies. And we see that, um, and they've served them. And we see that, I think, often in, in the way that they, that they teach. But so I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not sure. I think what we're seeing maybe is, is less a, a blurring of the boundaries and, and more um, a responding to the way uh, society and the economy is becoming more complex. As society, as the society and the economy becomes more complex, then the educational incline steepens right. uh, and the demands on educational systems change. I think what we're seeing here in, in this blurring is perhaps a dissolving of edges that used to be harder between colleges and universities, but I'm not sure that's a bad thing. In fact, I think it's a good thing. I think the dissolving of those boundaries um, is really required because the educational demands um, are, 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 they we, we need more collaboration. We need more conscious um, integration, I think, between all of the various elements in the educational ecosystem than has hitherto been needed. Right. Um, and, and, and that, I think, is, is maybe what's happening. And we're right in the moment of this transition and this change. And so in, it hasn't really worked itself out. And, and I, I think you know, the structures are beginning to adjust, but uh, I'm not sure that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. um, the, what I, I, guess what I'm, I guess what I'm seeing in this is a complementariness between what colleges and universities are doing, a little bit more back and forth, a little bit more dialogue, and, and um, it hasn't worked itself out. But I, uh, yeah, I, I think that's kind of a good thing and encouraging. Yeah, I, think there's, I think more there's more of that collaboration going on between various institutions at the post-secondary level than there may have been in the past. And of course, the government had, for many years now has, has uh, very encouraged that very much. Uh, so Rod, I'm going to turn to you. Uh, Paul has said that uh, 
you know, I'm not that he's not sure that the boundaries have really been that clearly defined. And if they have been, he's not so concerned about uh, any blurring of the lines that there's plenty of room for all, all players uh, in the continuing education field. What are your thoughts? I would tend to agree. I would, I would perhaps focus my answer a little differently. I'm going to go back to history. From my perspective, I think the lines have been blurred since the beginning. I mean, if we ask ourselves where did the college system come from, it came from, it really came out of the U.S. in the, in the middle to the like 1800s, came out of the Land Grants and Moral Act to really uh, look at ways of providing uh, agrarian education uh, to expand the West and to provide settlers with means to actually do that. Um, the, the concept of colleges have then been absorbed by other institutions throughout Europe, but really it is an American concept. Now that's important because when we talk about the blurring of the line, I say there is no boundary. There is no boundary because really the idea of lifelong learning was embedded with, within institutions and in universities for centuries. In fact, you know, apprenticeship and skill-based education was offered as far back as 1088 in Bologna you know, University, the very first institution in the West. Uh, Cambridge and Oxford, which one of the you know, preeminent institutions in, in the West as well and in the UK, included extensive uh, lifelong learning concepts uh, and, and really gave birth to the idea of continuing education, right? Um, you know, prestigious institutions, again, like Cambridge and Harvard has sustained their commitment to, to adult and, and continuing education. And as you said, David, the, the lines are a little gray. 38% uh, of colleges right now, at this precise moment, 38% of colleges offer degree programs. That's not new. It's been around for quite a while. And in fact, nearly all of them offer certificate programs. The, the point is this, it's neither good or bad. Uh, within the higher education ecosystem, we need diversity. And I think without trying to pin who's better or who's worse, I think we need to identify points of differentiation. And let me just pick out two easy points. And there are many more, but these are ju just two easy points for the sake of time. Colleges have really close ties with, with government. And as such, their boards, you know, the board of governors and the college committees are really in charge of creating programs that represent local economic needs. Universities have a much broader mandate. And as Chris Driver mentioned in our, in our chat function, universities, their mandate are more than just creating jobs or skills for people to jump into jobs. It's much more than that. Our governance structures within like institutions like ours within universities separates operational processes from academic processes. And as such, universities are global institutions. And here's where our value proposition comes in as a university continuing education unit. We are embedded within a global institution. And as such, we, we can actually inform local programming initiatives that are, that are informed by broader national and international trends. And I think, again, those perhaps are points of differentiation. But I would argue, historically, the concept of blurring of the line is, 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 a, false, is a false concept. Because, I mean, really, yeah. the origins of colleges are very clear, historically, at least. Thanks. Okay, so uh, let's um, shift gears a little bit and uh, focus our attention on, on a topic that's getting a lot of uh, media attention, a lot of uh, public uh, attention as well. We're hearing a lot about um, a lot of discussion, a lot of interest in micro credentials, which of course refer to short courses, short programs. So I'm going to ask you both, and we'll start with Rod, what do we mean by micro credentials, anyways, specifically? And if this is where we're headed into the future, what does this mean for the degree programs that universities have well been known for? Um, you know, if, if the focus in the future is gonna be on short programming uh, through micro credentials of various kinds, are we going to necessarily see a, the demise of the traditional degree programs? Because I think there are some concerns uh, that if micro certificates get, um, become too popular that uh, short course learning Will become the norm and degree programs will fall by the wayside. So yeah, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. We'll start with Ron, we'll go to Paul later. Ron? Thanks. Thanks, David. Another another doozy of a question. So um, let me begin by saying that when it comes to degree um, function, uh, absolutely not. I think micro credentials in no way will ever usurp 
the value of a degree. In fact, degrees will continue to hold significance in the labor market as reliable signals of knowledge, skills, and competencies. And in fact, the other point I would like to make and stress for everyone here is this, is that the uh, modulization of learning, uh, although can be innovative, although can have a purpose, uh, does not replace the importance of more comprehensive understanding. And the one point I wanna make before I launch into my definition of what a micro-credential is, as we're heading towards the fifth industrial revolution in the next 20 years, we're gonna require a much greater emphasis on human cognitive abilities human cognitive abilities, and that cannot be micro-credentialed, right? So that is something where traditional universities have had uh, a, a wonderful history of doing that. So in my view, absolute nonsense that, that the degree will go away anytime soon. In fact, the degree will hold its value and the degree its merit, it's in providing its learners with transformative uh, uh, skills uh, that will uh, inform their personal development. Now, what the heck then are micro-credentials? Well, micro-credentials are kind of a, a new idea. And the new idea is really this. It's really to say, if we're not going to touch, if no one's really there to uh, unfold and unpack the structure of universities and the meaning of more comprehensive knowledge, there also has to be recognition that we need to innovate and that we need to actually look at the future of university credentials and, and broaden our definition. A little bit and say, well, if, if implemented thoughtfully, can we insert short spurt education that can either augment or complement more traditional comprehensive education? And that's where I think micro credentials play a very important role. They are, by definition, short. They are short not only in duration, but they're short in the skills that they teach. Mm -hmm. Right? So they are short in, in, in duration, they are discrete. And they are usually based on in-demand skills. Now, there are two types, and here's the important point. There are two types of micro-credentials that are emerging. There is no universal definition. We are quickly working towards that. There is no, no standard-like definition, but there is a consensus. So right now, the two types that exist are the social and labor market skill-focused micro-credentials that are embedded within industry, colleges, and, and universities, right? And the second one, and here's the important one, the degree enhancement micro-credential. Again, not as a means of replacing, no, 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 but as a means of actually providing augmentation to, to, to degree programs that can either be standalone, stackable, or can ladder into a degree. Now, the value proposition is twofold. For a university, this means increasing participation of non-traditional students, whereby we can embrace and enhance our understanding of lifelong learning, and number two, the other value proposition for micro-credentials is this, innovation and pedagogy, the articulation and validation of learning outcomes, and the control of those learning outcomes by the learners in various platforms like badges or blockchain, right? So, so I think really, in many ways, it's not a threat. If implemented correctly, micro-credentials can simply complement what universities do. Now, right. let's talk about the, you know, the challenge. There is one challenge, and the one challenge is that we have to look at what the sector is doing. And right now, there is a trend and an evolution of what I call the, the talent analytics within the unregulated sector. And uh, really, it's, it's the use of, of aptitude test in lieu of any credential. So really, how are we as institutions going to respond to that? So again, providing a, a, a wider palette of options to learners is important, but to your point, David, the degree is not going anywhere. Yeah, well, this is a, this notion of, of the non-degree programming micro certificates and other alternative credentials complementing degree programs has certainly been part of the narrative uh, that we have been part of at the University of Manitoba in, in the last year or so. So I'm glad to hear that uh, um, you share that view. Paul, any thoughts on, on, on micro, uh, micro certificates, the focus and interest on micro certificates and uh, any threat that there might be to our traditional degree programs as we know them? I absolutely agree that there is no threat to our traditional degree programming uh, programs. Um, you know, the breadth and depth of a, of a traditional undergraduate ed education will continue to play an absolutely vital role in not only the knowledge economy, but the knowledge culture that we all live in. 
Um, so it's going to continue to have currency. I don't think there needs to be any uh, concern there. Um, you know, there are questions, I guess, of, of skills gap, uh, skills gaps, particularly as new technologies become implemented, uh, and that's really a kind of needs must. Um, you know, we, you know, we're in a process of transition and adjustment, and so smaller, focused, tight, skills-based uh, uh, programs or, or courses that makes a lot of sense to me um, as we transition in this way. So having something tight and focused is necessary. But uh, I don't think there's any threat. And in fact, I think um, I agree on the complementariness. And I, what I'm excited about, I guess, is as we begin to engage with these ideas um, a little bit more is maybe we get a little bit more innovative in our pedagogies and in our curricula. And maybe we don't just have, you know, vertical and horizontal degrees. Maybe we start to get diagonal degrees, by which I mean combinations of degree and non-degree courses, or a, a, um, a way to in, uh, in integrate uh, some of these micro certificate programs within other more traditional and established degree programs. Um, I think that's what we need to be starting to think about a little bit more and more. And, and I, there are early indicators that we might be but in order to get us there, I think what we're also going to need is a clear definition of what a micro-credential is, because right now at this early sort of nascent stage, the, one of the main currencies behind it, I think, is portability. And, and in order for it to be portable, learners need to know what it is, but so do employers and, and policymakers need to know what constitutes a, a micro certificate? What are the qualifications? How do we standardize this a little bit? Once we have that, we can start to get a little bit more dynamic, a little bit more imaginative in our pedagogical approaches in terms of how to integrate all of these uh, things in a meaningful way that will satisfy the economic sectors that are, are, we're trying to service, but also the greater population and society that, that benefits from an educated population. Right. So no concern from either of you then on the uh, non-degree programming as such as micro-credentials sitting alongside degree programs. So that on that, we seem to, to be united. Uh, I'm, just, um, I'm just mindful of the time. So I'm, I'm going to move to another question that focuses a little bit on our students, our lifelong learners. As you know, um, Extended Ed has been involved in facilitating lifelong learning for decades. In fact, we've been doing so since 1949 something that many people might not know. What would you say we've learned uh, from the lifelong learners that studied with us, particularly in the last few years? So what are we, what are we learning from our students? Uh, what, what do you think we've gotten right? Where, where do you think we need to um, change things up in the future? You sort of touched on a few ideas there, Paul. Maybe we'll, we'll start there. And if you can make any reference to you know, current programming that might be coming down the road, that would be great. Uh, sure. I mean, there, there's quite a lot here. Um, we've learned a lot. Uh, I, mean, I think together with uh, with our learners, our community instructors, our industry uh, partners, and so on, we've learned a lot about translating knowledge into action. Um, I, mean, I think that's a, a big a big part of what continuing educations have have done and will continue to do. Mm -hmm. um, I work with a fantastic program delivery team. Uh, it's talented and it's truly fantastic. And, and one of the things that we uh, together have really um, come to recognize is uh, that our courses and our programs are all about people, helping people transform them lives, their lives and, and strengthen their positions in the world. And I'm mentioning this just because everything we're talking about here, it's important, I think, to remember that there's a human, there's a human face attached to this, and it's ultimately about people and empowering those people. So with that in mind, some of the things we've learned uh, in, in more recent years, um, the economy has definitely become more complex. So has society. I've, I've touched on this. And, and as a result of that, you know, the requirements of our educational systems have to become more complex or, or, or adjust to that complexity to, to better meet it. Um, things are changing very quickly, right? Um, there, it, there's a rapidly emerging shift in, in emphasis away from ideas of fixed content knowledge uh, and towards a set of cognitive capacities, in fact, higher, higher level sort of uh, um, mental skills. Uh, basically, I guess I'm talking about a, a mindset, a way of seeing the world. Um, there's a, a growing, and as a result of this, there's a growing emphasis on agility, adaptability, 
uh, you know, one's ability to learn and evolve with a particular job or an economic sector. Um, and this is, this is changing the demands uh, from people. Uh, far and away, the greatest, uh, I guess, theme, the most recurring theme is this idea of, of evolving. Uh, so coming back to this kind of idea of lifelong learning and being an endless process of, of learning and, and, and completion. Um, we're seeing this everywhere. Um, I don't want to suggest, uh, you know, certain knowledge and skill sets aren't important. They, that's certainly not the case. Uh, I certain, I, I, I'm seeing a, a real uh, need for certain technological and data literacies. Uh, that's going to become uh, hugely important moving forward. However, and I, I, I touched on this before, we are really seeing an emphasis on a blend of soft, cognitive, and technical skills. And, and I really do, and I mentioned this before, but I really do think this is one of the great challenges before us. How do we bring, how do we come up with a, a program or curricula that harnesses or touches on, hones all of those kinds of skills? Um, this, 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 will be, uh, this will be a difficult thing. And I think key to this will be greater collaboration and conscious integration uh, amongst all of the players in today's dynamic educational ecosystem from K to 12 all the way through. Um, I think we're gonna to need to see more of that kind of thing. Um, and then once again, I think lifelong learning provides a, a, a valuable lens to sort of keep that kind of collaborative element in, in, into clear focus. And I think it will play uh, by extension a, a key role in facilitating that. In terms of what these programs might look like, um, I think extended education has some early glimpses of how we pull this together. We, know, we have a new uh, building information modeling management program or BIM management program um, that's uh, due to launch in, in, uh, in the winter. But here we have, we have drawn together the expertise from a, a diffuse industry. Uh, we have made use of the University of Manitoba's own academic expertise with uh, consultants from both the faculties of uh, architecture and engineering. Um, and we have developed a program that isn't just about, isn't really about building in BIM software. It's not about the technology. It's about the management processes that this technology facilitates. So all of the things that I've just talked been talking about, this, this combining of soft cognitive and technical skills, we see uh, neatly sort of packaged um, in, in certain respects in our BIM program. Uh, much the same can be said about our um, uh, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning program, which is also coming off the, off, off, or is it going to be launched in the winter, pardon me. And we have a course on understanding the business case for advanced manufacturing, which again, does the same kind of thing. Um, so, you know, these are just some early indicators of, of the kinds of collaborations, the kinds of integration uh, that can, can happen. The way we're trying to respond to the needs from uh, the economy and from learners. Um, but obviously there are lots of questions, um, lots of work left to be done about, the only thing we're certain of is that everything's going to be different. <laughs> right. Right. Well, I think the collaborations that you talked about between universities, extended uh, continuing education units, and industry are really exciting. And if you know, in the future, we have more uh, collaborations between institutions. I think that will even enrich those kinds of experiences. I, I'm mindful of the time, Rod. I'm going to go to you for a very brief response, if you can, on our last question, which really builds on on what uh, Paul has has talked about in the last few minutes, is just about future trends in lifelong learning future trends for continuing education programming. What, what do you see as we look down the road? Yeah, I mean, I mean, there are, uh, again, I'll try to make this very brief. There's certainly a lot to talk about here. And, and I think it's a segue to what Paul just mentioned. I think one of the really interesting um, challenges that we'll have is the, the ability to be able to build programs whereby we're mapping out prior formal learning of our learners. In other words, we need to have a really good profile as to who's coming to take our programs because there has to be a move away from creating users towards creating critical thinking practitioners in specific areas, right? So when we talk about upskilling, reskilling type programs, I think, I think we wanna move away from having people who are proficient in a, in a specific piece of software, but rather to be reflective and to use, you know, you know like critical thinking. So, in terms of the trends, I think there are three broad trends that we can talk about and, and, and uh, it will be very interesting to follow over the next 
decade or so, uh, there are going to be enormous impacts to higher education. Um, and, and I think that the digital revolution has really fast-tracked uh, this, in particular coupled with the pandemic. Uh, it is resulting in very exciting innovations. And I think, you know, like universities across the country and in other locations have responded uh, wonderfully in terms of what's, what's been happening over the last 18 months. Uh, so I do believe that higher education is going to go through significant changes. I think that there will be an evolution of university credentials and standards. I mean, we're beginning to do that at the University of Manitoba with our certificate and diploma framework, which, by the way, is one of the first that really has been developed in the country to move towards quality assurance measures. Uh, this is important because when we talk about going back to the idea of micro-credentials, if we do it wrong, there is... It, a lot of value proposition and micro-credentialing, but if we do it wrong, it, it can be disastrous because I think that uh, it, it, the wrong implication can have neoliberal uh, 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 you know, connotations of serving industry. And I think that we need to be very thoughtful in terms of how we implement these things. Um, mm -hmm. That being said, I think there is gonna be an evolution of, of a pedagogy. From a lifelong learning perspective, here's where the real excitement comes in. I think that uh, we will be moving away from a passive practice. The 35 to 40 percent of our of our alumni, you know, coming back to us, which we didn't know, uh, to a much broader mandate and strategy within uh, institutions, uh, and and really by doing that, enhancing our definition of what we mean by traditional learner. I don't like that term, but really enhancing the the thing to include alumni, and perhaps even include what other institutions are doing in the UK, which are creating alumni hubs, which is engaging with alumni and, and seeing what they need in terms of where they are in their careers and their professions, right? Embracing the idea of a learning web, as Paul was mentioning, this, this diagonal, where we are not only using the standard degree and post, uh, you know, postgraduate, but also looking at maybe other things as well that can enhance you know, the person's you know, um, you know, ability to have greater agency in terms of what they're doing with respect to their, to their education. Um, we will also be seeing enormous transformations with respect to recognition of education across institutions. And I think institutions are, are currently working on this to enhance transfer credit, to enhance uh, how we recognize portfolios. My credits, for example, is a step towards that direction. Increase funding for lifelong learners. Ontario has already done this. I think this is something that nationally will need to do. Now, with respect to future skills and occupational transformations in the workforce, I think the era of convergence of Industry 4.0, in other words, the area, you know, the the era of automation and human intellect, is going to really push us towards very interesting new domains where cognitive, social, emotional skills and technical skills will be all interwoven into one. And so, I think that when we look about the future and realize that we are going to be moving towards a much more distributed workforce, a much more global competitive workforce, the ability to remain in front of the wave uh, is going to be enormously important. And so I think it's a very exciting challenge for universities to embark on. Thanks very much. Um, that This has been a very wide ranging uh, discussion. Uh, Lots to think about. My mind is, my head is spitting right now. We have uh, a number of questions that we're not going to get to, but um, let's try to get to a couple of those questions in the, in the chat. I'm going to start one that has to do with micro credentials. And the question, and I'll just pose uh, maybe we'll have time for a couple here uh, to either of you, Rod or Paul, to respond to. So the question is aren't micro credentials a natural progression in a highly specialized economy? Degrees are great for things like teachers or researchers. But for most high-skilled jobs, it's probably most efficient to offer specialized training for job seekers and leave the academics to academics so that the university courses don't get diluted by employment goals. Thoughts on that question? Either of you? Uh, yeah, I think I think that's a great observation, but I think that you know we, we shouldn't you know remove ourselves from that function. So again, I'm not suggesting that undergraduate degrees need to be focused on skill outcomes necessarily. I think that there's going to be perhaps an application of experiential learning, but I think let's keep undergraduate education as undergraduate education. What we're saying here is can we embed within a university framework other experiences that learners can, you know, can take? And so Chris, you know, great point. 
So I think I, I think that we don't need to 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 meddle around too much with the undergraduate experience and, and that comprehensive, important or, or 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 liberal education, but rather can we create enhancements? And that's where I think there's an exciting opportunity here. Thanks for that. Um, anything, Paul, on that question? No, in the interest of time, I don't think I have anything. Uh, okay. Too much to here's, add. A, here's another question. Um, given the great depth and broadness of the extended ed programs, how really do these programs differ from traditional postgraduate certification? Isn't there, is there any equivalency with traditional postgraduate programs? Would either of you like to respond to that? Well, well this. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Rod. Paul, Paul, go ahead. Um, well, it, it's difficult to generalize. I mean, we have quite a range of programs, and they actually uh, meet a, a wide variety of different purposes. Uh, some of them upskilling, some of them reskilling. Um, you know, uh, in terms of a traditional postgraduate, uh, you know, again, I come back to the way our programming tends to fuse. Uh, sound theoretical knowledge with applied learning, um, and so sort of real world application, and, it, and it's it's sort of dancing that tightrope that is uh, some of the one of the definitive uh, features to my mind of of, of our programming, um, and I think that does differ uh, from a postgraduate type scenario, which tends to I think at least in my experience. Um, favor the the theoretical approach, the academic approach, and it gets away a little bit more from that uh, that applied real world application. Um, and I, I, so I, I do think there's a difference there. Um, but I, I do take the point that, uh, that that the distinction may not always be as clear cut, especially given how um, how robust a lot of our programming is. Great. And just to just to close, we have one other comment here, uh, sort of a uh, uh, questions, maybe uh, uh, reach out for some support. Uh, this uh, person says, I'd like to be able to share those stats on career change and reskilling and upskilling needs uh, that Rod, I, I believe you were sharing at the top of the presentation. So this person would like to share those stats with uh, in my organization, she says, and can you provide references or guidance where I can get those stats in writing and more discussion around this to share in a corporate newsletter? So, mm -hmm. um, that's from Shelly Mallow. So maybe we can connect the two of you offline later on. And I think uh, given that we're at the top of the hour, we should probably close at this point. I want to uh, say uh, a, a huge thank you to both of our panelists for giving their time uh, today and sharing their thoughts on Continue Ed, uh, the role of micro-credentials, upscaling, reskilling, and future trends uh, down the road. This has been most uh, um, uh, enlightening and very, very engaging. I appreciate those who joined us, uh, members of our alumni, members of Extended Ed and the broader university committee. Uh, this has been the first uh, ever homecoming webinar that Extended Ed has ever hosted. And so we're very pleased that we had a good audience. Um, and I hope that uh, you'll take advantage of some of the other um, homecoming activities and events like the football game tomorrow afternoon against the Regina Rams. Uh, if you're able to. So thank you very much. I also want to acknowledge uh, the, the huge efforts uh, behind the scenes, particularly among members of the marketing team who uh, promoted today's event and supported the, the event uh, behind the scenes. So thank you very much. Uh, and thanks again to Paul and Rod. And I hope you all have a, a great day and a good weekend. Thank you. <laughs>